China's stock market is collapsing. One of its benchmark stock indexes, the CSI 300, is down nearly 40% since its peak in 2021. This index measures the value of China's 300 biggest publicly traded companies. And currently, it sits at a five-year low. Tencent has lost 60% of its stock price, and that's China's biggest company by market capitalization. In just three years, all Chinese stocks combined have lost $6 trillion in market value. That's more than the economy of any other country except for the U.S. and China. Now, this may not seem all that important for outsiders, but actually it's a symptom of a wider economic downturn. As the value of Chinese businesses is dropping, China's economy is clearly not doing well, and people are starting to lose confidence. This is bad for the CCP, especially because this is not happening in the United States. The benchmark index of the USA, the S&P 500, is actually doing quite well at the moment. It represents America's 500 most valuable public companies. After a year-long downturn in 2022, the index has been rallying ever since. So, China is underperforming as compared to its rival and the rest of the world. This has earned it the title of the worst stock market in 2023. For the CCP, this is bad for its reputation, both at home and abroad. And it also raises some eyebrows when we look at China's GDP numbers. According to the CCP, the Chinese economy grew 5.2% in 2023. That is still low for Chinese standards, but there's a huge disconnect. The authorities say that China's economy continues to grow while the markets say that it's absolutely collapsing. With a little common sense, it's easy to see what's happening. The CCP is trying to spread a false narrative about its economy to remain in power. And that's why it's currently censoring any negative takes on China's economy on the internet. In this video, we'll uncover what's truly going on with China's stock market and the underlying economy. As you'll see, China's once successful experiment with the free market might be coming to an end. Let's start with the economy, as the stock market and the economy go hand in hand. So, the GDP numbers from the Chinese National Bureau of Statistics might give us a wrong picture about the economy. But first of all, we need to look at the shenanigans happening inside of the Chinese stock market. You see, at least a part of China's stock market is also fake. In 2019, over 50% of China's stocks were owned by institutional investors, and this number is on the rise. Institutional investors are organizations like banks, mutual funds, pensions, or insurance providers. They buy stocks to grow their capital. These kinds of investors also have a huge share of the United States stock market. But there's one key difference. In China, the CCP has a lot of influence over these institutions. Last year, Xi Jinping announced a new financial regulatory body called the National Financial Regulatory Administration. This organization centralizes the CCP's control over the financial sector. Basically, Xi Jinping wants the banks to put capital where the CCP needs it, putting an end to free market times. By pouring capital into the stock market, the CCP is already artificially keeping the prices up to fight the market crash. According to the Swiss UBS Bank, Chinese-backed funds have already bought $57 billion worth of stocks this year. The CCP-owned China Investment Corporation plans to continue pumping up the prices on the market. But most importantly, all of these non-CCP banks might also be influenced. With the new regulatory body, Chinese banks aren't allowed to hurt the CCP's political goals. Right now, that goal is to create an image of a strong Chinese economy. This is why China's institutional investors might not sell as many stocks as they would want to. Still, it's not hard to see how this won't work. There's a reason for the huge sell-off. Chinese companies earning less revenue and profits than they used to. Keeping the price up will create a bubble, which can only last so long. But Xi Jinping doesn't blame himself for the financial trouble. Instead, he points the finger at the bankers. Right now, he is cracking down on the hedonistic bankers that don't align with the CCP's goals. They've received huge pay cuts and bonuses were slashed by 60%. Recently, China's anti-corruption agency released a warning to the financial industry. 
it would seriously investigate and deal with the people who neglect the party's leadership in financial work and state-owned enterprises. It also said that bankers should stop having a singular focus on money, like in the West, and that they shouldn't form a financial elite. So something that the CCP really hates is short selling. Basically, short selling is where you make money when a price of a stock goes down through complex contracts. The Chinese Securities Regulatory Commission said it had zero tolerance for short sellers and that they would lose their shirts and rot in jail. Now, to be fair, there's definitely a point to be made against some bad financial practices. After all, we only have to look at the 2008 financial crisis to see how things can really go wrong. However, that's not completely what's going on here. In reality, the CCP is doing this to game its financial sector. Because the party can fire bankers at any point on the basis of degeneracy, it basically owns them. Going back to the stock market, this has some big effects. As the banks and funds aren't allowed to hurt the CCP's image, the real stock collapse might be even bigger. Even with the CCP's efforts, though, the stock market is still in a downward spiral. This is because retail and foreign investors are selling off their Chinese stocks in mass. There's something fundamental that the CCP can't cheat its way out of, an economic downturn. The earnings of companies on the Chinese MSCI index fell for four straight quarters. Apple, which recently posted its first yearly increase in earnings, had one weak spot, the Chinese market. Where the rest of the world had steady growth, Apple's revenue in China declined by 13%. In general, the Chinese economy has never really recovered from the COVID pandemic. Other nations have seen a rebound since the lockdowns due to huge stimulus programs. Consumer spending increased so much that there was even an inflationary crisis all over the world. But in China? Well, the opposite happened. It's now in a crisis of deflation. That may sound unfamiliar to many, because the United States last experienced deflation back in 2007 and 2008. It is the opposite of inflation, meaning that prices go down over time. This may sound nice for the consumers, but it's terrible for the economy. Consumers will delay their purchases, meaning that revenues of companies will go down. Let's say you've been saving up to buy a new car. If you know the price is going to drop in the future, you may decide to just wait a while. But if everybody does this, car dealers and manufacturers have a big problem. This applies for every other industry as well. And as a result, the entire economy slows with rising unemployment and declining investments. For China, this is a real risk, as deflation is increasing at alarming speeds. In January of 2024, consumer prices in China declined at their fastest pace in 14 years. But actually, this isn't what's plaguing the Chinese economy the most. If we dig a little deeper, we find another core problem. The deflation is related to something called the debt deflation spiral. Because of problems in China's financial industry, credit is drying up. This is the root cause for the decline in spending and in turn the increase in deflation. And as the financial sector and spending are related to the stock market, these problems also lay the basis for the stock market's collapse. So let's dive a little deeper into what's happening with this debt deflation spiral, shall we? Now, you may think that the debt problem in the United States is getting pretty bad, but <laughs> then you haven't seen what's happening in China. Washington holds about 120% of its GDP in government debt. In China, this debt-to-GDP ratio is a whopping 280%. It's not the government in Beijing that issued these debts, as the central government holds only 1 14th of the debt pile. The bulk of it is held by local governments. During the last 15 years, they founded many local government financial vehicles, called LGFVs. These are local government enterprises that prop up the economy. In 2022, there were almost 3,000 of them. They held about 80 trillion yuan, or $11 trillion, in debts. To put that into perspective, we're talking about approximately half of China's GDP in liabilities. In total, state-owned enterprises held two-thirds of corporate debt. More than 60% of this debt was in the form of bank loans. The problem is that most of these LGFVs aren't able to repay their loans. A third of them don't have a positive cash flow, and 60% struggle to pay their interest with their own earnings. 
Without support from the local governments, many of these companies wouldn't have existed in the first place. So this begs the question, how much of China's GDP is actually real? Another problem is the huge bubble of non-performing loans that this has created. After all, who's going to pay for the $11 trillion in debt? Last year, Xi Jinping ordered state banks to restructure LGFV debts at lower interest rates. But of course, he has a price to pay for this. All of these bad loans hurt the Chinese economy because there's less capital to invest in actually profitable businesses. The same is true when we look at its real estate crisis. Over the last few years, China's real estate sector has turned into a huge debt bubble. This is a big deal, as Chinese property is the single biggest asset class in the world. It's gotten so bad that the CCP is pushing banks to provide $446 billion to property developers. 50 of them are on the brink of financial collapse, including infamous companies like Country Garden. They've run huge Ponzi schemes, which came crashing down from 2020 onwards. Basically, the developers bought land and sold houses that they haven't built yet. With the money they received, they bought more land and then just did exactly the same thing. In 2019 and 2020, 90% of properties were sold with this pre-sale model. This led to huge liabilities on the developer side, with Country Garden and Evergrande holding more than $500 billion of them. This was made possible by corruption, but also because local governments needed to meet GDP goals. At its peak, the real estate market made up 25 to 30 percent of GDP. Because it was one of the key drivers of growth, local governments turned a blind eye to the Ponzi schemes. And initially, people weren't worried about the possible debt bubble. There was incredible demand for housing, and people thought prices would only go up. In early 2019, the price for a new house increased more than 10% year-on-year. Approximately 70% of Chinese household wealth was stored in real estate, and buying a house was very popular. The developers thought that their debts were no big deal, as housing sales would just continue. But now, the sector is in turmoil. The recent collapse of the property giant Evergrande shows that the real estate boom didn't last forever. In 2020, the CCP intervened to stop the debt bubble from growing. It limited the pre-sale housing model and banks stopped financing the property developers. Together with a slowdown in housing sales, this was the last straw. In 2021, Evergrande began to miss interest payments on $300 billion of its debts. After a period of battles with debt holders, Evergrande was finally liquidated earlier this year. Many fear that other property developers will follow in its footsteps. Now, you may be asking yourself what the local governments and property developers have to do with the stock market. But in fact, the LGFV and real estate crisis are some of the biggest reasons for the collapse. First of all, we have to look at the financial sector. China's economic growth of the past decades has been fueled by lending, which allows massive investments into businesses and infrastructure. And not just a little bit. In China, investment makes up 42% of GDP, which is heavily dependent on credit. Between 2007 and 2016, China's credit grew 18.1% annually, faster than the economy itself. Right now, China's financial system holds $53 trillion in assets, more than half of the size of the world economy. To put that in comparison, U.S. banks only hold $30 trillion in assets, so the credit growth caused the pile of assets in China's banks to balloon. But this Chinese credit machine is coming to an end. Chinese banks have to deal with a massive increase in non-performing loans. Basically, money that they've lent and they're not getting back. Some analysts say that it ranges in the trillions of dollars, although the official figures are much lower. The insane amount of borrowing has backfired, because many loans weren't really even viable in the first place. Apart from raising the risk of bank insolvencies, this also means that overall spending will slow as credit dries up. The bad debts show that China's financial system can't keep expanding forever. We can already see this in China's outside investments. But as you can see on this chart from Boston University, it looks like China's Belt and Road Initiative funds have fallen off a cliff. Many of the $1 trillion already planned projects have also been canceled. The same happened with China's holdings of U.S. debts, which dropped 
to a 14-year low. This all shows that Chinese funds and banks need the money at home. What's even worse is that this financial turmoil results in deflation. Banks giving out less loans means there's less money available. Using basic supply and demand economics, this causes prices to go down. But there's a catch. This can spiral out of control. During a period of deflation, the real value of debt increases because the value of money goes up. In simpler terms, businesses with debt carry a load that just keeps on getting heavier. Eventually, this can lead to the collapse of these businesses because it's hard to stay afloat with that much weight on top of you. In turn, this leads to even more non-performing loans, less lending by banks, and more deflation. The stock market is anticipating something like this because it thinks that the Chinese economy is heading for a debt deflation loop. It's like a domino effect. One problem leads to another, and the whole market feels the impact. Before talking about the next effect, I need to ask for something. Because bad news about China's economy often gets censored, this video won't get far in the algorithm without your support. By leaving a like down below, you help us tremendously. All right, without further ado, let's get back to the basics. These problems in China's financial sector also have a huge effect on the confidence in China's economy. To understand this, we have to look at the price-to-earnings ratio on the Chinese stock market. This is the price of the stocks divided by the earnings of the underlying companies. For overall confidence, these numbers are very telling. The higher the price-to-earnings ratio, the more expensive the companies are, and the more trust there is in the future. After all, you only pay a higher price if you think the businesses are about to grow. When the price-to-earnings ratios go down, well, it's the exact opposite. People think growth is coming to an end, and they pay lower prices for companies. That's exactly what happened in China, as we can see on this chart from JP Morgan. In 2021, the price-to-earnings ratios peaked at 19, so stocks were 19 times their underlying earnings. At the start of 2024, however, the stock prices were only nine times their underlying earnings. So the price-to-earnings ratios were down more than 50%. In other words, trust in the future was cut in half. We can see the same development in the price-to-book ratio. This is the price of companies compared to their book value, the money they're worth if they sell off all their assets. You can think of this as their net worth. In the United States, stocks are worth four to five times as much as their book values. That means companies are expected to grow in value and not go bankrupt. In China, however, the price-to-book ratio is only 1.7, dropping to a five-year low. So the data are clear. People don't have confidence in Chinese businesses anymore. This is also true for foreign investors. For years, banks and investment funds invested a lot of capital into the Chinese economy because of its growth miracle. In 2021, foreign direct investment peaked at more than $300 billion. But now, the country has the first outflow of foreign direct investment in 25 years. As you can see on this chart, it reached negative $11.8 billion in the third quarter of 2023. Last January, the outflow in the stock market reached more than $2 billion. This is the longest and strongest outflow of foreign capital since 2014. The debt deflation spiral is obviously one of the biggest reasons for the lack of confidence. But we also have to talk about the increased geopolitical risks. Because China and the United States are competing for power, there has been an economic face-off. This began to gain steam during the Trump administration, where he placed many sanctions on CCP entities and put import tariffs on Chinese goods. His argument was that the massive trade deficit with China, which reached $418 billion in 2018, was hurting the American economy. In the following trade war, the United States and China increased tariffs on hundreds of billions of dollars worth of trade. U.S. President Joe Biden left the tariffs on $350 billion worth of Chinese goods. In the area of technology, he even escalated the trade war. The United States has tried to cut China off of technological developments by limiting its chip access. There are just a few American, Dutch, and Japanese companies that control the advanced chip supply chain. All of these companies are not allowed anymore to sell their most advanced products to China. For example, NVIDIA can't sell its most advanced AI chips to the Chinese market. 
China's own chip companies are several years behind the Western ones. So this is a huge obstacle for its technological progress. And there are fears that the geopolitical turmoil could get even worse. There's a real chance that China invades Taiwan in the near future. A U.S. general predicts that this could happen as soon as next year. Xi Jinping is already 70 years old, and he may want to reunify China before he passes away. If the situation around Taiwan escalates, the trade war between the United States and China will obviously worsen. Washington and its allies could adopt the same strategy as Russia, namely to cut China off from world trade. But the thing is this. That's already happening to some extent. As the relation between Washington and Beijing worsened, companies started to diversify out of China. The new Apple manufacturing plant in India is an example of this. Because of these geopolitical developments, China is slowly losing its position as the world's manufacturing powerhouse. This also has its effect on the stock market, as the future of China looks a whole lot less bright. But the fact that the stock market shows all of this also has political consequences. It's not hard to see why the Chinese Communist Party and the stock market aren't a match made in heaven. The stock market is one of the hallmarks of capitalism, and that's something China isn't very comfortable with. Or is it? Starting in 1978, the country started to implement free market reforms under Deng Xiaoping. He created special economic zones, which don't have a planned economy. As we all know, this was highly successful. Millions of Chinese moved from rural areas to the cities. And real wages exploded, as you can see on this chart. Although the CCP still likes to classify China's economy as developing, it's really a developed one already. GDP growth was in the double digits for years, and China has risen on the global economic leaderboard. Where it was the seventh biggest in real GDP in 1980, it quickly became second, overtaking Japan. It went from a GDP of $396 billion to almost $20 trillion, a 50-fold increase. The reason for this was quite simple. China had something to offer the world's free markets. It had an abundance of cheap labor, so could outcompete anyone in the field of manufacturing. Although the Chinese government was still communist in name, it increasingly adopted capitalist ideas. The Shanghai Stock Exchange, which was first opened in 1866, was reopened in 1990. In 1993, the CCP went as far as to amend its constitution and to create a socialist market economy system. It's basically capitalism with a lot of wiggle room for government influence. This marked the end of China's Maoist period, with the disastrous Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution. But when Xi Jinping rose to power in 2013, things started to change. Where his predecessors liberalized and decentralized the country, he did the exact opposite. By removing the term limits for the presidency in 2018, Xi Jinping has practically become China's supreme leader for life. This has also had its effects on the economy. Xi sees the free market economy as a huge threat to his power, which is why he may be ending the capitalist experiment. He doesn't see the private sector as something on its own, but as something to serve the CCP's goals. The party wants to cultivate a team of private economic persons who are resolute in walking with the party. If you phrase this a little differently, it wants private enterprises to do what the CCP says. To achieve this, it has established CCP bodies in many of China's companies. 92% of China's top 500 companies have these bodies, a number that has been on the rise during Xi's presidency. To further solidify his rule over the private sector, Xi Jinping has also been cracking down on many of China's entrepreneurs. In the last few years, China has arrested multiple prominent businessmen, including Jack Ma. Xi Jinping says this is to fight corruption, but many experts think it's something different. The Chinese president wants the most powerful citizens to know who's in charge. With these political changes in mind, we can look at the possible reactions of the CCP to the stock market collapse. For Xi Jinping, it's both a huge threat and a giant opportunity. On the one hand, it reveals that he failed with his economic policies. The reason why the Chinese put up with Xi's power grab is that he provides stability prosperity and growth. As the stock market shows, the situation is now the exact opposite. This could result in him losing support. 
But if Xi Jinping plays his cards right, he can also benefit from the current stock market crisis. He can just point the finger at the private sector, as he already does to some extent. This gives him a reason to return to a centralized economy, giving him even more power. All in all, the stock market shows a very interesting story. It reveals a lot about the false CCP narratives, the underlying problems of China's economy, and the lack of trust in the country's future. This definitely won't be the last video I do on China's economy, so be sure to subscribe and keep updated. And as always, thanks for watching. YouTube's algorithm thinks you'll like this video the most. Click and find out if it's right.